Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. A hyper-intelligent mouse has taken up residence in the studio. After weeks of evading capture, we have offered him a position on staff per HR's Evasion Employment Initiative. Please welcome to the team Mr. Radio Jingles, our newest executive of commercial breaks. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, C.M. Alexander, alongside Joshua Kahn. Hey, everybody. And Benjamin Graham. Hey, constant readers. You can call me the Big Juicy. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Ben's the electric chair of the podcast. <laughs> it's the nickname oh. for the electric chair. Yeah. It's just too good. Yeah, old Sparky. It's, or It's what they called me in high school. People have to sit in you? <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> and today, <laughs> we have another Patreon selection by our friend Andrew Edmark. We are covering the Green Mile through part two for those of you who are following along. And if not, major spoilers ahead. And Josh is leading our discussion. First question, what is everybody's baseline for The Green Mile? Read it, seen it? Both. Both? Both. Both. Okay, this is my first time reading it. <gasps> oh! Ooh. I have seen it. Okay, so you but know. But I think I've only seen some of it. Oh, interesting. I I know certain major things. I know ab- about Tom Hanks getting his junk grabbed. <laughs> and I know Spoilers. And I know <laughs> what happens to Delacroix. <laughs> Okay. okay. Those are the things I remember. <laughs> that That's interesting because one of the things I wanted to talk about in this episode is this might be the best King has ever been at foreshadowing. Yeah! Because if I didn't know what happened in this book, there are single sentences that I would have passed by without a second thought. Do you think that's because of the way that it was written? I think there's a good chance, because was he writing it, you know, without knowing the whole arc of the story, or did he have it all prepared from the beginning? So what we're talking about, listeners, if you're not familiar, is that this book was kind of an experiment. It was written as a series, so it was a monthly release. It was, like, wildly popular. It was hugely successful. And when I was reading that, it's in the foreword, I was struck by something that the way this book is written is precisely the way we talk about all Stephen King books on our show. We yeah, just it, it cover them in it sections. Down, uh, yeah. Into into digestible pieces. I like that. Yeah. yeah it makes separating this book out really easy. Yeah. Really <laughs> one of the first two books that were released. Yeah. Do you did uh, obviously Josh, this is your first time, mm. but do you remember when the books were being released? No, because I read it, I think, after the movie had come out. I can't remember if I watched the movie first or not. But I do remember thinking, like, wow, this movie is fantastic. And it's, like, the best. At the you know, I hadn't seen everything at the time, mm-hmm. but I was young. So I was like, I know everything. It was the, I felt like it was the best Stephen King adaptation that I had seen. I mean, it was it, so, like, well done. We'll get well to done. it, but I <laughs> yeah. would not argue with that. Yeah. No, I remember, because this was also... Well before I was still in the no, too scary, will never read a Stephen (laughs) King novel mindset. But I remember when this book was released because my dad was reading it. Mm. And I was so intrigued by it because at the time I was in what? I had to have been in fifth, sixth grade, something like that. Mm -hmm. I was still pretty young. And seeing this novel come in little bite-sized books, I was like, interesting. (laughs) I... And, and then, of course, the first book is titled The Two Dead Girls. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> nah, I'm still a ways from this. This is jumping episodes ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's, you know, we're back in a prison with this kind of more like this very straightforward so far story. It reminds me of Shawshank Redemption, mm-hmm. but I would say a thousand times better. 
And I know that's like a weird thing to say because everybody loves that. But I personally am so much more like sucked into this instantly than I was the Shawshank Redemption. Today, I went back and re-listened to all of our selection for today's, which I, (laughs) our listeners know, don't (laughs) usually do. (laughs) But just to refresh myself and also, yeah, it struck me on this second listen to this time, Mm -hmm. I am so immediately drawn in. And nothing's really happened so far. Mm -hmm. So far, reading just Just this section, what Mm. is this book about a a prison? That's that's Mm -hmm. it. But it is so compelling. The world building, Mm -hmm. which is weird to (laughs) say world building when it's just an old timey ward in a prison. But you get such a sense of place and a sense of time. Man, you can tell what kind of episode it's going to be when we don't even get to play. (laughs) Yeah. And we're like already. Oh, also, I just have to mention for the listeners, we are experiencing a pretty severe thunderstorm. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it's really going to yeah. help the vibes. I'm, just gonna, enjoy, I'm not uh, going to bother with trying to cut it out. She's going to be there. At DPR's <laughs> first ever ASMR episode. <laughs> Josh and I have the perfect voices for it. <laughs> so shall we get to <laughs> what the story? Yeah. 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 So uh, we are getting this story as it's being written by Paul Edgecombe, who is the former superintendent of E-Block, which is the Green Mile. It is the death row on the Cold Mountain Penitentiary's uh, prison. Real Whatever. quick, before, to interrupt again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how much do you figure this book has penetrated the mainstream consciousness that we have to describe what the Green Mile is? I feel like the movie is mm-hmm. so, like such a touchstone yeah that i think if you say if no one knows anything about this book the green mile is just what you think of that's death row yeah i think so i think it's become fairly synonymous yeah Yeah. but the reason it's the green mile here is because it's all green linoleum that runs down this corridor and i think that's super cool paul has overseen over 78 executions during his time running ebola and this is like He's telling about a time set in the, like 1932. Yeah, is 1932 that right? is when John Coffey arrives mm-hmm. on the block, which this story is told jumping around in time through Paul's experience on the mile. So this the first interaction we get is when John Coffey arrives. But then we jump years and years previously mm-hmm. to how kind of how we got to there's the record scratch. Er, I bet you're wondering how I got here. And then we go back and we get all that stuff. Because The Green Mile is a sex comedy, correct? <laughs> That's right. Is that yeah, I, teen I sex comedy? I would love to see. We did, uh, before the recording began, I mistakenly said that my copy has uh, Tom Green on the cover. That's a much different thing. Uh, so yeah, I'd love to see that version of The Green Mile. <laughs> The uh, Paul Edgecombe <laughs> was your average everyday superintendent. If it That's was what sexy, it though, yeah, yeah, it would exactly. be Paul Edgebone. Oh, That's, there it is. That's, that's the one. Can we get a job at Mad Magazine? <laughs> Let us know. We're so good. <laughs> <laughs> this whole first chapter of this story is just Paul saying, I'm 60, I'm in a retirement home, I'm writing the story, which obviously lends itself to the format of this story being in the six different chunks and it all feels very stream of conscious. So Mm -hmm. it it all meshes well. The thing in the first chapter that stuck out to me so much was not only that I I feel like I could walk around this place with no trouble Mm -hmm. is the, uh, when he describes the executions and about how the prisoners are usually fine, and then it's once they get their ankles clamped into the chair, and they realize that their legs have finished their career. I was like, oh, Ooh, fuck, yeah. that's dark. No. the it just, I don't know, that got me of come, you're, realizing your death from the ankles up is such a powerful... And you get so much more uh, about those final moments and about mm-hmm. how they relate to the prisoners, how they take care of them in their final days that I think is really fascinating. I'm sure we'll get to kind of as we go along. Can I tell you what stuck out to me? Yeah. The whole bit with Beverly Matami. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. What did you guys think of that? Cause I have so many thoughts. I didn't think much of it. Honestly, it's, it's interesting. I, I am interested to see how far the book goes in later chapters towards this idea of 
the unevenness in the justice system that is hinted <laughs> at and kind of very obviously a uh, main contributing factor is they talk about, you know, uh, much more often black people are brought and, to the green mile. And men. And men, yeah. Beverly is interesting, though, because it worked for and against her. So she was described, Paul was just, this is like in the very beginning when he's talking about some prisoners that they've had there and just giving you that backstory. And he talks about this Beverly woman who's a black woman who husband had beat her relentlessly for six years. And then the way he describes it is that she put up with that, but it was the cheating she would not tolerate. And so she kills him. She like slices him with his own razor and spills his guts on the floor. Good for you, Beverly. <laughs> but what I think is interesting about it is that a little bit later, he um, references a man will come to know a lot better, Edouard Delacroix. And he raped a six-year-old girl and killed her and then tried to set her, well, didn't try, set her body on fire behind the apartment complex. The apartment caught on fire, killed like six or eight more people, six two people of them two children. children. And he mentions that Edward, like that was the only murder he had in him. And now he's just this mild mannered guy. Mm-hmm. He doesn't see murder in his eyes. Glad you brought it up. Which is hilarious because you don't mm-hmm. start with raping and murdering a child. Like there are crimes, like you work your way up to that. And it is really easy not to rape children in prison because there aren't any. But it's funny because Beverly, I feel like it's a um, female male thing that's very representative of the times he said that so she was on green mile and then the governor stayed her execution so she left and she went to the small town was a librarian he saw her obituary several several years later died as an old lady and it you know said she was well loved and then in very fine print below like an afterthought served 10 or 20 years Mm -hmm. in prison and he references that he could still see murder in her eyes and Mm -hmm. i just thought that was interesting because it's like one of those i've I've listened to a lot of true crime things where they're like well they didn't mind being beaten but the minute they cheated it's like that is such a man's perspective like Mm -hmm. to assume it's i hadn't connected those two thoughts because i had thought about and i love paul by the the way it's not a criticism but yeah but but I, i had thought when he introduces eduardo he's so not forgiving of the crimes right but like it is very weirdly like well he did it now he's you know, just this shell, meek, this accountant looking guy. And like we are expected to give this character, especially later on as we get to know him, I feel like we are expected to Sympathize, feel sympathy yes. and to like this character, despite the fact that he is a child rapist and a murderer. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I hadn't thought about because he says, like, <laughs> in the case of this black woman, oh, she was always a murderer yeah and and in her obituary her old lady picture you could mm -hmm. see that she would gladly slit your throat yeah if if it tickled her fancy that's he described it very callously this guy who did this horrible thing i'm gonna spend 150 pages telling you about his mouse (laughs) i I know it no i hadn't noticed that but that does (laughs) it was just interesting i don't i'm not like bitching about it i'm just like no that's that is a very accurate representation and i'm probably gonna eat my words later but i'm gonna say it here (laughs) i Remember what happens to Edward. I don't remember how gruesome it is. Extremely. So, so it might I might regret saying this, but don't feel bad for him. Well, the whole thing <laughs> is so difficult because we'll get to that in our uh, yeah, discussion well, yeah, about. <laughs> in in theory, I always try to be good leftist and I believe in prison abolitionism. But it's so hard living in America where the idea of these people are terrible and should be punished because there's that part of me that's like, yeah, he should be on death row. He did this terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard thing to balance in myself. Yeah. Man, we'll talk about that later. I think but I think the the most obvious thing is that Paul is writing this post knowledge of what happened to Delacroix probably and colors so his I, yeah. experience so no, I, I agree, think yeah. I think that if Delacroix had been off the mile as uh, easily as say the chief his description of Delacroix would not be so friendly although I I do have one argument against that and it's a quote from this section he he references 
whatever it was that had done that awful thing was already gone, and now he lay on his bunk, letting his little companion run squeaking over his hands in a way that was the worst. Old Sparky never burned what was inside them, and the drugs they inject them with today don't put it to sleep. It vacates, jumps to someone else, and leaves us to kill husks that aren't really alive anyway. Yeah, but Paul's wrong. He's saying this because he feels bad for what happened to right. Delacroix. He wants that yeah. to be real. I don't think that's he... That's how he deals with the horror yes. of what happened. That's, that's how he deals with the guilt of mm-hmm. letting what happened to Delacroix happen. Because ultimately, it's Paul's fault. Yeah, which we're not happens. even going to get to no, in we're not this even episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cr- I had never... Reading this, uh, I I had not gotten the idea of Paul as an unreliable narrator, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but that's really interesting. Yeah, and he does show a lot of compassion because he also says here because Beverly wanted to change her name. Or she said her African spirit father mm-hmm. came to her and told her to take uh, her true last name, and he says never refuse the condemned. And we'll get more of those things. And it's such an interesting yeah. thing about the compassion they all show and, yeah, wh- this, and why they show it. This book does take place in a. Uh, fictionalized fantasy 1930s <laughs> all of the cops in this prison are great people except for the one racist <laughs> that is true that's yeah. fairly true uh, let's actually let's talk about the the two other major staff that are on e-block because we have paul who runs things but we have brutus howell brutal and Ooh. percy wetmore do you want to tell us about percy oh my god he sucks so bad <laughs> holy I'm jesus sorry. christ <laughs> Can I? Oh, yes, please. I, I don't want to talk about the every piece time, of shit. Oh, every time I listened <laughs> and read through this, because I did it several times because it's so fun. I, I don't, I've i never done this before, I don't think, but Percy inspires this in me. He's just such a hateable, perfect mm. king character. I am listening and I'm driving in my car and <laughs> I'm coming up with like insults <laughs> even though i know you know there's there's no point but i'm like yeah it's little lady oh. hands which, <laughs> and they're not even good insults and if you're a man out there and you have lady hands i support you unless you're a piece of shit like this and in that case fuck everything about you but <laughs> he's such He's he such is a horrible piece of the, shit the the trope of like just Creating a character whose entire purpose is to be the most hateful <laughs> monster you could possibly imagine. He is the, <sighs> the, the biggest. Like a Mrs. Carmody, but man. stupid, so it's more offensive. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just this uh, egotistical, narcissistic asshole who uh, we are introduced to. Shouting dead man, dead man yeah. walking, right? Mm-hmm. Which, Classy. Uh, yeah, uh, bringing in John Coffee, which uh, before we should talk about Percy in in contrast to John Coffee, because the first thing we we are introduced to them together, mm-hmm. and Percy is marching him along, and it is described as like. As though he thought he could move this man if he tried. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Percy is short and like not skinny, not fat, just like delicate though. Yeah. Just a, a, a little, little wuss. Little guy. He's a he's a yeah. little George Costanza, is what he is. <laughs> except hateful. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. has achieved all he's achieved through nepotism alone. Yeah. Yes. He's uh, what, his uncle? His or- yeah, his Mom, wait. <laughs> the his, governor's, the wife's governor's wife is his nephew. aunt. Okay, yeah. sure. But he's he's introduced to us dragging the biggest man that's Six, ever eight. existed. Six eight, three hundred pounds. Yeah. Uh, Im- imagine, if you will, Michael Clark Duncan. Imagine <laughs> <laughs> the most perfect casting ever. <laughs> CM, you told us about Percy. Ben, tell us about Brutal. Just a a quick thing about who Brutal is. Brutal is basically Paul's second in command, although there aren't such uh, distinctions. It's just everyone kind of gets that if Paul isn't there, it's Brutal. And Brutal is like the the Little John character. Mm -hmm. He's just a big brood of a dude who is also extremely kind and caring Mm -hmm. as much as you can be uh, in a place like the Green Mile. And he is still dwarfed. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So we get 
coffee to his cell. And when the new arrivals come, Paul sits on their bunk waiting for them. And he stands up to give them this welcome speech. I love he, this scene. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love this scene so it's much. so fucking good. One of the things that jumped out to me is as he's preparing, he's reading through the file about John Coffey. Like, and it just when they talk about the details of him, it's listed that he has numerous scars under the scars section. And I feel like we're going to get to that. Like bunches of scars. Yeah, like when, it, when an area for specific scars just has multiple written mm-hmm. in it. Like that's that's a lot. But he he essentially like gives him the rundown of like, hey, this is how your life's going to go here. You know, we will treat you uh, with respect and courtesy. You do the same. Uh, you know, we play the radio. And when he mentions the radio, there's a moment that Coffee doesn't hate. He looks at me. He's like, it's like he doesn't exactly know what I mean until he explains it. And I love that detail about Coffee that he's like, yeah. he remembers things. But mm-hmm. when they're not right in front of him, they it's just gone. become ethereal yeah. a little bit. Like he's, he says he's not an like an idiot. Yeah. He's not yeah. Educated. He, he Percy thinks he's slow. Percy mm-hmm. thinks that he has some um, mental issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Paul doesn't think that's what it is. It's just, it, it is like he isn't entirely there. there. He's somewhere else. Yeah. He's in his own world. But the key is that when he asks if there are any questions, almost immediately, John Coffey asks if they keep a light on because he's oh scared of the gosh. dark. And th- this is so interesting because it touches Paul and it touched me. And he he says, like, he makes a comment, like, they do touch you sometimes because you, and I love this, it's so, like, beautiful and dark, you don't see them at their worst hammering out their horrors like demons at a forge. Oh. Yeah. The, some of the writing in this book <laughs> yeah. is so... And that inspires him to shake Coffee's hand, which is something he's never done before. And, like, later, I just remember holding on to that moment, like, that moment of respect and kindness when mm-hmm. we figure out more of what's going on that Paul showed him. I like that Brutal sees it and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> All right, whatever. Those last words of Coffee's, though. Ooh, I tried to take it back, but it was too late. <sighs> Th- this is one of those moments that Ugh. I like you hear that and it's obviously designed to be a fucking dagger of a sentence. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. obviously reading through it the first time. There's only one thing that can mean. Right. Oh, yeah. And the way it unravels is uh, mm, it's, so good. I also would like to, um, so I'll say this now because we're covering the movie, the book and it's a safe place. But when I watched the movie for the first time, I thought it was a true story until <laughs> oh, a no. certain point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you two are great. I love you both. <laughs> Yeah, that's a testament to how well done the movie is, because I could see that it does feel like a very serious, straightforward, based on a true story movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never heard Ben chuckle like that. It's so funny. It's so funny imagining that you got to the end. No, not the end. <laughs> and then you were like, wait, based on a book by Stephen King? <laughs> oh, my God. When I saw it the first time, it was on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where they edit out all the locusts. <laughs> it was uh, by the time they got to locusts, I was pretty sure oh. that it wasn't based on a true story. Oh god! <laughs> Obviously, that sentence though piques Paul's interest, like it would anybody's, and he decides to do some digging and find out what exactly brought John Coffee to us. And it turns out the articles are super easy to find because it was front page news. Uh, John Coffey was sentenced to death for the rape and murder of the nine-year-old Dederick twins. And uh, I listened to this on audiobook and was reading it. And all my rereads, I skipped this chapter every single time because being a dad's broken me. Uh, I could see that. It's very graphic. It's so graphic. Well, one of you tell us about the Dederick Twins, so I don't have to. It's a really (laughs) great chapter. I can see why you would not want to relive it. Yeah, because suddenly it flashes back, and it almost, to me, feels like this could be a standalone book. Did you guys get that feeling? Mm -hmm. Because you are with the family. Like, it's... It, they're real. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is the middle of the depression, 
and we meet this farming family who, based on the standards of the time, are well off enough because they have land, they've got some animals. They and pay their grocery bill every week. Exactly. And uh, they're a good family. And one night, their two young daughters ask to sleep on the porch attached to the house. Something you do in the country, mm-hmm. up even through the 90s, I feel yep. like. <laughs> And the next morning, the parents are out doing morning chores. The dog doesn't come barking, but there's no reason to worry about that, right? Right. And their son finds the scene. Their porch ripped open and everything asunder. And the husband and son sprint into the woods and this is what makes it feel like this this feels like the opening to a western almost (laughs) where it's these homesteaders like hunting down the person yeah uh this criminal and it talks about how terrified they are not in finding the criminal but in in their haste, making a wrong turn because they're farmers, not hunters. But they are. Oh. But they feel like the scene is fresh enough that maybe they have time to save them. And all through this, the wife is gathering a posse, and there's this great scene of her calling the the operator because God, she, they're on the scene. exchange. Yeah. That's yeah, one of yeah. the ways that they know that their their family is well off is they can afford to be on the exchange. Mm-hmm. And she calls up the operator. Operator stops. And then before helping, immediately identifies her and knows what is happening already. It's such an amazing mm-hmm. little bit of like, it helps you understand the smallness of this mm-hmm. community the, the that they're so urgent with it and yes. so immediately one of the moments like that breaks from this chase after that phone call is there's like a what five page backstory for a sheriff we don't even meet yeah but it's also this serialized storytelling is built for <laughs> king yeah mm-hmm. it, that the king backstory that will never matter but it's still so interesting. Anyway, a posse gets rounded up and they meet up with the dad and son and they they take their bullets. That's so good. And then don't tell anyone that they're the only ones that they took the bullets from, Mm -hmm. which I think is... Real they smart. Pro- they probably should have mm-hmm. taken everyone's bullets. But that's just me. They they spread and they reach a a stream, right? Mm -hmm. A ravine. And the hunting dogs, which fucking... King character of the book is yeah. the, the hunting dogs guy. Um, the hunting dogs Bobo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, break and a few want to go upstream and if the rest want to go downstream and they end up going the one direction which leads them to wailing and through the whole time they've been finding the girl's clothes. Yeah. Like it's awful. It's so gross. And when they find them, they find John Coffey, this enormous man with these two girls dead, covered so so covered and matted in blood that their blonde hair is now red. And naked. And and he is cradling them and screaming into the sky. Oh, which it's, I just got goosebumps. Yeah, like it's just thinking about what we find out later about the that. Scene, kills the, me. The, it, it, I can picture this tableau that King paints mm-hmm. with the circle of men with guns coming down on. And, and seeing this and the, that they didn't just murder him right there. Mm-hmm. Especially for the Again, times, like mm-hmm. two uh, fictional fantasy things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But they they ar- arrest him, and that's pretty much all. Paul goes on to say, like, I didn't figure all of this out in, in that the, one in afternoon. That one yeah. afternoon well, in this he was hot. very compl- like he was very emotional. Mm-hmm. But they said like he's wailing and screaming, but looking in his eyes, it's like he's not there again. Mm-hmm. Like other people have noticed that. But when they ask him who he is and to search his pockets. He's very calm and compliant with them. Yeah. Oh, the the other piece of evidence, quote unquote, that is left to us and mishandled immediately by mm. the police is that they find the family's dog has been killed. And there were 
breakfast sausages left behind. And when they find John Coffey, he has a small lunch, and there are no breakfast sausages, and they use that as evidence. Yeah. Well, and he also can't remember what his own breakfast was. Mm. So when they ask him... Yeah, he doesn't yeah. remember where he's from. He yeah. doesn't know anything. And like he, they talk about that he doesn't have... But he doesn't have an accent, but he speaks with a cadence of an accent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's so much that's yes. an anomaly about him. And uh, Klaus, which is the father, mm-hmm. attacks him. And the sheriff, who is taller than, like, outweighs the dad, like, he's just so strong in his grief that he can't pull him off him right away. Either. It takes, like, four people it, to pull him yeah, off. Yeah, he, like, kicks him probably. in the head, I think. Yeah. Which, again, when you look back on that, you're just like, oh. And the yeah. fact when, the, when they ask him... What happened? He says, "I couldn't help it. I tried to take it back, but Same it was too thing. late." Paul heard, and then, yeah. like the next sentence is, "The jury came back with their verdict in forty-five minutes." And then that's the same thing he said in court. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, the next day, Paul comes in to the warden's office and uh, has two very important pieces of news. One is that Delacroix is getting; he has his date of execution, so that is going to be coming up soon. And they'll be getting another prisoner, Will Wharton, a 19-year-old, who they've told him is going to cause some hell. Who just doesn't care. And the other piece of news is that uh, because of the dead man walking, all of the shenanigans that Percy was doing, Paul kicked him off the, the mile and made him go do grunt work that day. And so the other piece of news is the warden saying, look, I got a call from the governor's office. We can't be doing this. Just, you know what, we're going to... Run our time out. Percy has an application for someplace else. It's going to be accepted. Briar Ridge. Yeah. Briar Ridge. Hospital? It's a mental health mm-hmm. facility. Oh, please don't put him Which is vulnerable individuals. It's just, remember it for later. <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a desk job, though. He won't be with any patients there. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so essentially, the deal is play nice, be fine. So the deal has become if you put him out for Delacroix's execution, he'll go without a problem. It'll be just fine. And uh, Paul agrees. That is so disgusting because it's like, oh, this guy wants to murder someone. Gross. (laughs) Yeah, but it'll get him out of our hair. So it's fine. I think it's it's later in the book that he basically says something like that, that he was able to keep Percy under control and all it cost was the life of a Frenchman. (laughs) Yeah, all right. (laughs) Which... Boy. Rem- well, another thing, remember for later, because yeah. <laughs> there's so much of that that's just like, it, it is, it is, I don't know how much I can say I without know, giving anything so away, because the, the wording makes you think one thing, one and thing, mm-hmm. and yeah. maybe there's more. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's such a unique way of looking back then on everything is heartbreaking. <laughs> what did you guys think about Hal Moore, the warden? I think he's kind of cool. Yeah, Paul says that he worked. He's worked for five wardens in his time, and he's the best. And they've, I think, they've worked together for like five or six mm, years. Yeah, and so they just have a very good relationship with one another and look out for each other and just have like a professional, respectful relationship. He also has a wife who has severe migraine headaches, which turn out to be a tumor that's Ooh, going yeah. to kill her, which is extremely sad yeah. and upsetting too. It's interesting because Paul makes a comment like he cared for her because and he's married and happily married, but Mm -hmm. she was a woman he could have loved, which I thought was like a an interesting way to like a classy kind of way to say something like that. That feels like someone a very old timey way to uh, that's a compliment that that you Mm -hmm. would not raise an eye at back then. Not like I throw it. It does feel. (laughs) (laughs) He can't. Dick's on fire. (laughs) <laughs> oh, something we haven't yes. even mentioned no, yet. We that yeah. is weirdly important. Which is why Tom Hanks is in the movie because he has he to, to pee, pee in every movie pee. he's in. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves. No, yeah, we hadn't mentioned that <laughs> Paul, the entire time he's telling the story, this whole summer was the summer he had the worst urinary tract Which is extremely his, important to the story. <laughs> which is weirdly relevant. Yes. We're not just being weird. <laughs> This is not boner talk. No. <laughs> this is flaccid talk, if anything. Broken boner talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, he pisses white hot fire, essentially, during, <laughs> during, during this section of the book. Ooh, like Billy Zane. <laughs> <laughs> Dean the Night. I'm sorry. Oh, I, my God. I've been sick. I'm all over the place. <laughs> uh, all of this 
makes Paul think about the first appearance of Steamboat Willie slash Mr. Jingles. And it happened on the night that Paul was sending out customer service surveys, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> I think that means it's time for someone to hit the uncomfortable conversation bell. Ding, ding, ding. They point out like, it's a very interesting that he says he says that it's morbid. It might seem morbid to send out customer service, but in effect, an execution is providing a service. If you showed up at midnight to this prison to watch someone die, you had a reason. Mm -hmm. And these customer surveys are basically saying, were you satisfied with how things were handled? Yeah. So let's <laughs> talk about where we all stand on capital punishment, because now's as good a time as any. I'm going to take a bold stance here. It's bad. It's I, are we going to be on different? I'm going to take a bold <laughs> stance. I'm for it. I'm going to take a bold stance. I am a hypocrite because <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Ben. It's bad. Like I, I am against it because the, the issue is that you cannot always be certain because of corruption and very awful things that happen. The risk of executing someone who is innocent, the, the argument is that that is not worth, it's not worth that price to execute accidentally execute someone who's innocent. We can't take that risk at all. It's too great. But then, you know, having being someone who listens to a lot of true crime things and hears a lot of awful things, there are certain stories I hear where it seems like, oh my gosh, that's so straightforward and what was done was so heinous, like raping a little girl and setting her body on fire and killing a bunch of other people, that even though I am against it, I support that person like put a bullet in their brain. And so I know that's hypocritical and I'm just going to own it and say, I feel both ways at the same time and I've never been able to sort it out. So what I don't do is judge how anyone else <laughs> answers that question yeah. because I understand both. And I, I wish I could, I wish I could take like a firm position, but it's when I'm hit with those particular stories that I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like, re like not even revenge, just those people shouldn't exist. But then again, too, some of those people who shouldn't exist, who have that story that's like so, oh, all the evidence, all the DNA was there. Sometimes that's all bullshit, too. As you have, you have people who, who are like it, doing DNA that are falsifying it. Like, if we have that, how can we execute people? So I get both. Sorry, go on. Is that prevalent in... It, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about falsifying there, DNA. I've heard of several cases where issues like that have happened. I don't think it's I, I think it's a minimal number. But the problem is like that minimal number is completely unacceptable because you're killing someone who's right. of this crime who is innocent. I I worry that I'm not smart enough to talk about this subject because I, I'm not well versed enough to eloquently state my stance. And a lot of people will think my stance on the matter is fairly radical because I do not believe there's any, it's hard, right? We as don't have a right humans, to kill other people. As humans, yeah. it, there is this, you know, feeling that is very real and very, the knee jerk feeling of this person has hurt so many people. They should be removed from the population. Mm -hmm. And my personal feeling is no amount of killing is okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's a matter of like, what is, what are we gaining from the from more death? Hmm. We we want we designed prisons and capital punishment to punish people for their crimes. Mm -hmm. But if, if we are punishing like and it's not it's not oh Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's a complicated issue. It's, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, it it's if we can gain the same amount of like if you could guarantee imagine a hypothetical situation something someone has done something terrible and you can do something you can give them something to guarantee they will never do this thing again mm -hmm. but they are going to get to rejoin society mm -hmm. the knee-jerk reaction is to say no fuck that they need to pay mm -hmm. right yes but where's the like? Right. It, we we have if we can guarantee that this pain does not continue, then then why excise? And I know that this is obviously there is yeah, no solution. There that. is no pill that makes crime people stop doing crime. Mm -hmm. But prison abolitionists believe in 
taking the money that goes into the bullshit prison industrial complex and putting it into programs where these people, the to first of all, stop crime from happening in the first place, the battle, the things that cause the, the societal pressures that cause murder, and also the people that do to come up with some system I, to I, remove the yeah. danger without having to continue the cycle of murder. I definitely categorize crimes differently. I think we have a lot of people in prison who do not need to be there for victimless crimes or, you know, mm. having marijuana and stuff. Mm. And but I do feel differently when it comes to people who rape women because mm. that's like a first step. You know, you mm. you rape a woman and you get sent to prison for it and then you get out very quickly or you just get a slap on the wrist. You don't even really get punished. The next woman you rape, you kill so that you don't get caught. It's an escalation of behavior. Sure. Um, people who do the very heinous things. And that's where I get tripped mm. up in how I feel about it personally because I think they're broken and it's unfortunate and I realize it would be better if we mm. could fix what's broken and help them and and some some people who have maybe mental issues that contribute to crime and I'm not saying mm. that people who are mentally ill commit crimes it's a different thing but things that are wrong with brains that people just cannot feel that empathy or are for example attracted to children sexually I'm sorry I know that's mm -hmm. fucked up that you're that way but you need to not exist and not be in society around other people to hurt them which I probably sounds also shitty and I'm a social worker and I'm not supposed to feel that way but I have to be honest like I I see both sides and I'm so lost in it. it it's a thing I I this this conversation is inspiring me. I'm going to do some more research on prison abolitionism because I also obviously I am not saying throw every person in prison right now out onto the street with no yeah, oversight, I mean, no further. We're not doing obviously. it right for sure. That's yeah, no yeah, question. A system that exists yes. <laughs> as it is sucks yeah. and can be done better. Correct. But I'm also but not. But the answer is complicated and that's why we have these discussions yeah, because there is no easy are, answer. So I, I'm no going yes to do no. some mm -hmm. more research and listeners, uh, either this episode or next episode, I will have some research, <laughs> uh, so, some resources for you to read from people smarter than I am. I, I'm very excited about that. That'll be cool. I've never heard anything about the prison abolitionist standpoint. Josh, you said you were for. Do you want to share more of your thoughts? Sure. Agreed. Prison reform. Uh, so much prison reform needs to happen. But I do... There are people who are too dangerous to to be in general population. There are people too violent to exist without doing further harm. And a life sentence is not always a life sentence. People get out for certain things. There are new, for instance, there there's several cases that are going to appeals that people who are sentenced to life in prison for heinous murders are getting their cases looked at again because they committed those cases when they were a minor and new laws have passed that now open all of those people who a particular case we're all familiar with where somebody's body was chopped up and burned. Yeah, in our hometown. In our hometown. <laughs> and, oh. and those people are are having appeals happen so, now. Yeah, they could get but out they, of prison. It's possible that they they committed a crime that was given a life sentence that no longer is a life sentence potentially. And that to me is too great a risk. And I just, I, I feel like that, yeah, there, I, I, I do think that there are, I know that, that it's state by state. I don't know if there's an overall regulation for what criteria meets capital punishment, but I know that at least a few of them, it is, it, it has, the crime has to be proven as uh, murder in the first degree, which is premeditation mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, which is not crimes of passion, which is a big thing for murder. <laughs> That's like people, why we have different yeah, categories. People too, who murder complex. one time are usually the people who are have do that kind of murder. Free killer Sally. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I haven't finished that documentary yet. Spoiler alert. Um, and yeah, but it's it's very complex. I feel like I lean a lot towards that middle row where CM is. As opposed to being like, I would die on on the hill for the rights of capital punishment. Oh, I, I yeah, but, I could be swayed by someone yeah. who knows more. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you guys a very personal question? Yeah, yeah. Either of you kill anybody today? <laughs> no. What time is it? 
No. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> huh. it, was it hard not to do that? It was not. Yeah, same. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all right. I just... I. <laughs> I, it's so weird. I know we. this is a very long tangent on a book club podcast that's not about the book. But I like that we can have these complex conversations mm-hmm. that are very hot button things and, um, and, and listeners, we respect each other at the end of it. <laughs> there, yeah. there is a lot of reading on this subject. Mm. Uh, I maybe we'll do a, a special episode or something. Where That'd I'll be share. super That'd be cool. cool. I'll share some of my findings because yeah. it is something that I, the little I do know about it, I, I always just tend, I try to tend toward the path of least hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And it is hard because some people are awful and have yeah. done monstrous things. Yeah. And it is it is hard to practice empathy towards people who have done unforgivable yeah. acts. It's okay it's hard to be to have, confused though. Yeah, it's hard to have yeah. empathy empathy for people who don't have any. Yeah. yeah. Like and that's it is. I, yeah. Any listeners out there who work in the prison system who have want to share what yeah. they think. Reach out. We'd yeah. love to hear. Let's talk about a cute mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the night that Mr. Jingles got his job on Blocky. <laughs> I think it's such a cute like way to do this story that everybody is just kind of hanging out doing paperwork and (laughs) this mouse just crawls out and is looking in cells like it's a a tiny little patrolman. Yeah, he's described as being just like one of the team almost the way he's looking through the cells. They initially name him Steamboat Willie. (laughs) Which is very cute. Yeah, although I prefer Mr. Jingles. Me too. Not to give Edward any (laughs) any credit, but... It's just a better name. This is though, oh, Percy again. Yeah. Hate him so much. All the all the other guys like Dean, Harry, Paul, Brutal, they're all like fascinated by what's happening. Because I imagine something like this too in a setting like that mm-hmm. means so much more. It's just like this bit of magic. And here comes fucking Percy. God. Who as they're I think they're feeding the mouse a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they're like tossing him little pieces of a sandwich. Something. Yeah. yeah. And he'll only take food from the guys who are there all the time, yeah. not the floaters. That's so and they like great. test it out and it's adorable. And Percy lobs like very quickly his baton yeah. at the mouse and it almost hits Mr. Jingles and then he takes off and Percy takes off after him throwing a fucking fit and this leads to like one of the more fascinating parts kind of that we alluded to in the beginning brutal i think is the one who gets really upset with percy like wants to throttle him and they're Mm, all telling him calm the fuck down man because you scared the prisoners and he's like well you guys baby the prisoners and they're like no we keep them calm because men who have nothing to lose because they're on death row mm-hmm. have nothing to lose. And it is our job to make sure that we keep them safe and calm and that keeps us safe as well. And it it just makes so much sense and it illustrates why they treat them and they should treat them like humans, why they do that, why they have the radio on, why Paul has that mm-hmm. speech, why he shook Coffee's hand, why he does feel sympathy for Edward. Just all of all of these things. It's like, yeah, they have to. This is their world that they live in. And when you take everything away from somebody and they're left with nothing, there's no telling what they might do. So this is the only way that they can maintain control over them. Yeah. It's just fascinating. It's, yeah, it's so great. And this all all of this initial stuff. It comes to the fact that we jump again to years later, the the mile is empty and Brutal has been cleaning out the restraint room that they said they've seen Mr. Jingles run to and from. That's mm-hmm. how they mm-hmm. know he's coming from there. And all that's in that room is it's the padded room, straight jackets, uh, a Popeye fuck book. <laughs> <laughs> father's fuck book. Father, yeah, that's where they keep their father's fuck book. <laughs> Uh, and I just forgot about supplies. the Tijuana it's, Bible. It's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> it's so strange. But it's it's all these years later, and Brutus was cleaning it out, and he found where Mister Jingles was hiding all the time. Mm-hmm. There's this little alcove in the ceiling that he hid in, and when he's like, "Paul, go up there and look," he doesn't think he's gonna see anything. But he smells peppermint, which we don't know what that means at this point. We get it in part two. But he, he smells peppermint and sees colored pieces of wood mm-hmm. from a spool. And he's like, son of a bitch. And they both have like an emotional moment 
doing this that leads them both to be like, this is it. Like we're not executing another mm-hmm. man. You, we're we're gonna get transferred. The this is what makes me like brutal and Paul the yeah, most. The the sure. scene where they it's such a what's the word I'm looking for? Intimate is tender. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, it it's such a an honest emotional bond, which you wouldn't expect from men two in men, that decade. Either, which yeah. is exactly uh, it, it's. The the emotional honesty that they share in this moment of saying vulnerability, vulnerable, yes, yes it's vulnerable. That is the word I'm looking for because <laughs> it they just like look in each other's eyes and say we mm-hmm. this was a bad thing, yeah. um, and we we cannot do this anymore. It's so interesting because several times Paul says, "I don't think Mister Jingles was magic. I don't think he was supernatural in any way. I just think he was the smartest mouse that ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> Which I like. <laughs> like yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, but the the fact that this story comes from, you know, he, he pulls out the wood spool and the, that vulnerable thing Brutal shares that when he went off to school, he took his mother's handkerchief so he mm-hmm. could smell it whenever he missed yeah, her. Yeah, he's saying he's, he kept that to remember Edouard, yeah. the mouse captain. And the implication that the mouse took a souvenir to remember a loved one by is so crazy. Also, like Paul at one point says, like God deemed Edward not worthy enough to have like a real guardian angel, so sent him a mouse. Yeah. Which Paul is very religious, by the way. We haven't mentioned mm-hmm. that either. There's a lot. Yeah. We'll not, get to that. Not in a gross way so far, like a way that irks me, but he definitely has a lot of strong thoughts when it comes to faith. Mm-hmm. It's it is nice to have a religious character we don't hate. Yes. For once. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> All right, let's jump to, to book two, The Mouse on the Mile. Uh, the first chapter is a complete recap of the first book, which makes sense because these were all published separately. Mm-hmm. But again, I think it it's fits. Not, oh, it, it's not, sorry, like, Doctor Sleep. Where it's yeah. Like, oh boy. Oh, this <laughs> again. I thought about that. I was like, "This no, it, is it how you adds, recap." Yeah, it adds context. I feel like it, and it it, it sets up something <laughs> that becomes important later. Just because we know that Paul is an old man writing this. Yeah. It, at one point, he says, "Look at me writing all of this at this odd old age, and all old age mm-hmm. is odd, isn't it? Don't worry about it." <laughs> So this story, this book, a lot of it revolves around the pre-John Coffey. We don't get any more John Coffey in this entire Mm -hmm. book. This is all... (laughs) In the rest of the book. (laughs) He's not there. (laughs) In the the rest of this, in in book two, no more John Coffey. (laughs) Oh no, my brain's broke. (laughs) A lot of this is about the chief. This book deals with the chief getting his date of execution. The chief is... Didn't write down what tribe he was from. The chief was sentenced to death. Because he crushed a man's skull with a cinder block uh, in a fight over a pair of boots. During a drunken fight. During a drunken fight over a pair Mm -hmm. of boots. He didn't rape and murder a six-year-old girl. No. Which is nice. Not that you should crush anybody's skull over boots or any other reason. Depends on how nice the boots were. (laughs) (laughs) And there's this moment where they... In the first book, we didn't really touch on it, but Brutal at one point says that he tried to get the talk started with coffee and mm-hmm. didn't get very far. And it's not the talk that we're familiar with. There's no bang shies <laughs> in the prison. This talk is that, alluding to CM, what you said earlier about keeping everybody calm, the talk is about keeping them grounded, keeping them tethered, because this is the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. They need someone to be the rest of their life. And he says that, uh, he asks Paul that, If Paul thinks, if a man truly repents, when he Mm -hmm. dies, he might get to go to the place where he was happiest and live forever. Mm -hmm. And Paul's like, yeah, I think that's pretty much exactly what I think. And then his internal monologue is like, it it, it isn't. But I'm not going to tell him that. He basically, (laughs) he, he goes a step further, though. He then, he's like Old Testament. He's like, and there is no forgiveness for murderers. They will never go anywhere but hell. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I want to talk about the chief's. Not his, the execution quite yet, but I want to talk about the prep because before the execution, it's the chief gets to say goodbye to his family. So they have him down in the, the visitation room, all private. But while he's busy there, everybody on the mile is doing a dress rehearsal. Mm-hmm. Ben, as somebody who's been involved in a lot Touch of dress me. rehearsals. <laughs> oh, yeah. This scene gave me big community theater vibes. <laughs> <laughs> would you, would you play... 
the condemned uh, in uh, the scene. Are you joking? <laughs> no. Would you play it like toot toot, please? Absolutely <laughs> not. No, this is, uh, okay. So the scene is they are going through this walkthrough of the steps leading up to the uh, execution. And they are using toot toot weird old man <laughs> who sells goodies. He's not on death row. He's, he's not on death row. He's, he's, he's just this a weird hospital's old man. Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing the cart around selling yeah. stuff. And, and they're using him and he's being a real fucking creep about it. Uh just not taking it seriously. He says he Toot Toot was never more alive than when he was playing a man condemned to death. Yeah. Yeah, That's how into it he gets. It is morbid and gross. Mm-hmm. And Paul kind of like reprimands him. Uh, and, because, the like, and the others. Yeah, and the others because the others are laughing at it. And he's like, he's he doesn't like, want them to laugh. It's kind of funny, I guess. Later, though, during the real execution, because exactly. you're under a lot of stress well, killing it's someone. Practice like, how you play. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yep. no, wow, very guys. much okay. true. Mm-hmm. If you are practicing something, you if it is a somber occasion, you should be treating it as such Mm. and there i can't think of many more somber (laughs) occasions than you know state mandated murder they're they're walking him down paul kind of tells him let's let's do this for real and they strap toot toot into the chair and i start yelling at my book (laughs) i i do not care if it was an Active electric chair. You could not make me sit on that thing. <laughs> yeah, where people have died too. Bugs. Like you've. Yeah. I am not a religious or spiritual person. <laughs> I do not believe in ghosts. But that chair is haunted as fuck. And you will not get <laughs> my ass on it. Ugh. You don't want to sit on the lap of Big Juicy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. That's so gross. I think I have to change my stance now. I'm against. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, I, I, a hundred percent. Especially if they are going to go through locking any of it. I'd yeah, sit no, down. no, no. I wouldn't let them clamp shit you on me. You wouldn't ride Big Juicy. No, I would not ride Big Juicy. No, thank man, you. Man, man, man. No, I was filled for Big Juicy. Stops with me. Ju- just <laughs> reading the. The thing at the beginning that you mentioned, yeah. the the clamping your legs down, and gave just reading about it gave me such existential dread. Yeah, horrifying. It, I, yeah. <laughs> no. I can't. I can say like, oh, I can. I can't imagine being in that position, but just I can almost imagine it, and almost imagining it is horrifying. Yeah. What did you think about the fact that the rudimentary setup of the execution room has the witnesses in the same room? As the chair. Mm. That's crazy. And the janitorial supplies. <laughs> yeah. Which is so uh, weird. Part of it's me, just well, a they, shed. Well, they moved them out for the execution. Part of me thinks, and again, the, please don't judge me because I said I was confused about how I feel. If you are going to support execution and participate in it by witnessing it, you should see every moment of it. Yeah, but usually there's like a like No, you a should wall. be right in there. Like a glass. Because if, if you can't stomach that, why are I, you there? I completely agree with I you. Yes. Yeah. If you are so dead set on having your blood for blood, then enjoy it. If yeah, if somebody enjoy did something to dough. me that I felt that warranted, I would probably want to be as close as possible. Wow, you really took that just the totally opposite direction that Ben and I were talking. I'm, no, I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I get you though. <laughs> I, I run on vengeance. It's my <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bruce Wayne. What are you Vengeance, talking vengeance about? and spite keep me motivated the way coffee and cigarettes do for other people. Uh, Dark all right, episode. Yeah, it really is. It, we, we're doing it on a stormy day. We yeah, said it was going to impact us. True. We've heard the tornado sirens we've go also, up like three times. <laughs> like as far for listeners, we've you know this is another one of our delayed recording sessions. We've all been busy or sick or all the things. So I'm honestly just glad to be in the room with you guys. So yeah. just like, I'm we just excited. to talk to each other <laughs> in <Right>. weeks. <laughs> so let's talk about the execution. Bitterbuck is his real name, uh, who they called the chief. And he, I like that the start of this says, if you can say an execution went smoothly, this one did. Because <laughs> yeah, in the end, someone is dying. It, his daughter actually consumed this for me. That's all. I only mm-hmm. thought of her in this execution I wasn't really thinking of him at all because she you know, wanted to braid his hair and have um, like feathers and stuff in his hair to honor his tribal heritage and asked 
Paul if she could put the feathers in, and he said, no, it's against state regulations. And he didn't tell her the reason it is, which is they would catch on yeah. fire. And it was just in that moment, it's like, man, just, it'd just be so hard. Like, you'd want to show this family member who's going to watch her father be killed mm -hmm. compassion, and you can't explain to her why. And she just handled it, you know, yeah. like a champ. But yeah, there, the moment I had some conflicting feelings about this that when he says that the daughter takes that news doesn't make a big deal of it she kind of internalizes it that it ensured that bitterbuck was also going to be compliant because he saw his daughter showing that strength also they mentioned that earlier too yeah. when a man has family on the outside they mm -hmm. can keep him in line more yeah. easily and he they go through the process and the last station before going into the room is Paul's office where they have the priest mm -hmm. and he s talks about seeing bitter, but cry. And the line is something to the effect of, I like to see them cry a little. It's the ones that don't, that worry me. Mm -hmm. And I had mixed feelings about that line until I remembered something that when they did the run through, it's from this room that there's like the door frame isn't, large enough so you have to crouch and it's a, it's a very vulnerable point in all of this and at first i thought he was just kind of being a dick <laughs> like i like to see him oh, cry to, yeah. to know they're sorry but then mm -hmm. it occurred to me that anybody who's not crying now might be planning to try to an, like an mm -hmm. escape or something and gonna, i was like oh it's not gonna go easy yeah. yeah and i was like oh that makes way more sense yeah. i don't think paul's an asshole but that <laughs> threw me real bad so i wanted to mention it and I like that the way he strengthens Bitterbuck. Yeah, that was this. interesting too. Yeah. Cause he's he's starting to like realize like I'm going to die and starting to freak out. And he Paul says to him, you know, and again, not even to show compassion necessarily, but just to be just to keep him calm so they can do this and you know, he's not gonna be fighting because he says there are men who go to the chair screaming and he's, never stop screaming till they're dead. That he's broken fingers yes, to get like their hands their off finger, the bars. Yes. Yeah. And he basically tells him, don't let them see you break. Be be strong, essentially. I think mm -hmm. that's what it is. I, I don't know. I, it probably wasn't back then. And I'd have to do research to know if that's true now. But I think you can't if like you broke somebody's finger, getting them out of their cell to go to the execution. I think you can't execute them. I you think have that to take qualifies cruel and unusual punishment. I think that I, I, I'm pretty sure that wasn't how it was in the 30s, but I I read that and I I meant to look it up and I didn't. But well, I then if you're on death row, you just break your fingers. You just keep breaking bones, <laughs> which honestly, all right. <laughs> uh, but after they roll uh, roll on one, and then roll on two is when the electricity goes through the body. The doctor comes out and listens, and there's irregular heartbeat still, <laughs> and just to be safe. They run him again so he doesn't wake up full of lightning <laughs> in a bit. And they they kill him. They do the execution. They take him out. And when they get in the tunnels to run him to the ambulance, they have pulled the mask off and one of the braids is on fire. So Paul is like smacking the dead man's head, putting it out. And apparently Percy thought this was okay. And he just comes up and smacks the face of the corpse. I yelled at Percy so much. He reading this book it's cartoonish mm -hmm. the level of hate this dude inspires yes. <laughs> it's the it's how proud he is of himself when he like smacks it and i just i wasn't expecting brutal yells at him and is like hey man paid his debt he's square hands off and i guess i anticipated the defense but i didn't realize it would be so strong that i i I get that, you know, the execution that wipes the slate clean uh, in, in the eyes of a lot of people. But I just I found it I found I, it interesting that Br that Brutal was so adamant about this. I think it's just because it's so disgusting. It's yeah. something someone that you would put in a chair and do that to would do to someone. That's and this a person very is in charge point. of people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That makes perfect sense. So we've talked about uh, Delacroix. But now we're going to get to see how he arrived. Again, another great entrance by Percy Wetmore. Fucking Percy. As he beats this man onto the mile. Because he thinks he tried to cop a feel yeah. on his butt. Yeah, not only is he racist, he's homophobic. He's yep. everything that you could make you hate a person. Put him in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 
It's the yeah the he saying he tried to he tried to grab my dick, and I love that Paul is say, says to him, no no one coming onto death row has ever been in a frisky. Yeah, mood. even the most like sexually <laughs> lecherous inmate could not get hard under these yeah. circumstances. <laughs> and that brutal essentially says he pulled him too hard, he fell, and he reached out like anybody would. It, mm-hmm. Percy was just looking for an excuse to unleash his baton on somebody who is smaller than him. And that's what Percy does. Mm -hmm. He only picks a fight if the odds are in his favor. Really Mm -hmm. makes how they handle Percy so great because they keep mentioning that like Percy is clearly a coward. Yeah. He's a, a weak piece of shit that only picks on people that are smaller than him or he believes to be mentally weaker like yeah. John Coffey. So when Paul is like, hey, you're being a real asshole around here, we're we're going to beat the shit out of you if you keep it up. <laughs> yeah, he threatens yeah, him with, do- <laughs> with brutal. Yeah, he's, he's like, like, brutal doesn't like you and when he doesn't like people, he doesn't file reports. He uses his fists, yeah. not a pen. And Percy's like, what are you trying to say? And he's like, I'm not trying to say anything. I have said it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Paul. <laughs> because if you hit a man like Percy, yeah. you can't unring that bell. You I, might as well go on hitting. I do not yeah. believe in capital punishment, but I do believe in hitting <laughs> homophobes. Be- beating the fuck out of people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then we get recapped to Dell, as they will just refer to him as Dell, adopted Mr. Jingles and Mr. Jingles adopted Dell. And he named him that because Mr. Jingles whispered, whispered it in his it? ear. Yeah. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe he did. Like, For sure. stuff happens. No. I <laughs> love that, yeah, there are these little, like, magical realism moments that are just Paul as the narrator is like, it's not important if the mouse is magic. <laughs> don't worry about it. It might be. It's not what we're <laughs> here about. Yeah. I do love that. Yeah. But it's the moment that Percy enters the mile. And at this point, Mr. Jingles has learned some tricks. Delacroix has gotten him to like run across his shoulders and and all this stuff. Push the spool back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All this stuff. And when Percy arrives, everyone's like, oh, great. Percy's going to see the mouse, his greatest nemesis. And (laughs) Del, his. A mouse would be that fucker's greatest (laughs) nemesis. (laughs) And and They're his punching bag down. equals. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think Mr. Jingles is smarter. Sorry, I yeah. need to insult this guy who's not real. Are you busting out all the insults you've been saying yeah. in your car? Yeah. Girl hands. <laughs> a delicate bitch. Take that, lady fingers. So, uh, it, but it turns out Percy's actually fine with it. Well, you find and, out why later, but yeah. yeah, he's he's pretty. He's uncharacteristically chill, and so Paul like plays into that, which is really interesting. And he gets a few strange looks from the fellows around him. Cause he's Dell is like, can I have a box for my mouse so he can sleep with me? And Paul's like, Hey Percy, he wants to, he wants to make a bed for his mouse. Isn't that hilarious? And he's like, well, I think it's just going to shit up his nose, but if he wants to do it, I think too has a cigar box that he mm-hmm. might sell him for 10 cents or something. And, and if he if he can get that, then I will provide some bedding. Yeah, it's uh, so uncharacteristic. And then Paul notes like, oh, Dell has his pet and Percy has his. Yeah. But whereas Dell will care for and love his pet, Percy's just waiting till he can murder his. The reference to Dell being his pet Oof, yeah. like hit me so bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, jumping forward to the morning of Paul's melted penis. <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> the morning of Wild Bill is, is what I meant. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I love that this, this scene yeah. opens up because they still have an outhouse because it's the, the early 30s. And he goes, he wakes up and he goes outside. He cannot make it to the outhouse and just drops trow and peas in his front yard, like screaming, basically. Oh, he <laughs> like trying... almost falls to yeah. the ground because he's in so much pain. Uh, and uh, what is it? The Because the only medicine is sulfur, sulfur. and it yeah. makes him yeah. sick well i'm allergic to sulfur really yeah i didn't know that well don't get don't a get a infection. fire penis don't I get won't. a fire penis <laughs> become also uh allergic to penicillin <laughs> that exists now can i become allergic to penicillin i don't suddenly? think so no man ben don't say shit like that to me <laughs> <laughs> and paul's decided i need to get this taken care of this has gone on long enough I'm going to go to the warden's office, put Brutal back on the mile so somebody's there for a wild bill, and I'm going to go to the doctor. So 
plan is set. But as soon as he gets to the warden's office, he finds him in in a in a bad way. We mentioned it earlier. His wife. Mm -hmm. This is when they found out that she has a brain tumor. And the poor warden is like he's like they're excited about uh, the The great pictures they got. Yeah. And how dark that is. Can I also, he hasn't told his wife, which is really infuriating because it's her fucking body. Yeah. She's the one who should have been told she has this and it just, you know, well, women are property then. And it, and she, we're talking, she's going to be dead by Christmas and we've established it's, what, August? It's like late summer, I think. Something like that. Yeah. And the warden has a, a full breakdown mm-hmm. and lets Paul. I like <laughs> that Paul thinks, like, he's like, damn, I wish... Like, I'd give anything not to see this because sometimes when you see a man at his worst, he holds that against you. But he doesn't think the warden will do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is too bad. Uh, It's really well written. It's it's just too bad that they have this this moment of him, you know, supporting the warden. And then afterwards, the warden, of course, does the man thing of straightening up and not looking each other in the eye. And it's like, it's so close to being another moment like the moment between Paul and Brutal of like genuine adult male bonding, which is not a thing that happens a lot in Hey fellas, you can cry. Yeah. I I cry all the time. I love when men cry. I cry. You cry right now. Constantly. Uh, let's move on. (laughs) Um, That scared me. (laughs) (laughs) But the, the reason they don't have that vulnerable moment is because that's why Paul decides mm. to stay at work. Instead, he just doesn't ask for the day off. He's going to power through the day. He'll go tomorrow. And I, he goes down and sits on Wild Bill's bunk, thinking that the worst <laughs> of today is behind him. Uh, would anybody like to describe Wild Bill Wharton? Wild Bill is a 19-year-old dumbass violent kid who thinks he's... Thinks he's Billy the Kid. He wants to be called Billy the Kid. Yeah, he Billy has a tattoo yeah. of Billy the Kid. And they were warned how awful and dangerous he is and that they would probably have to struggle with him. And because he's so young, he's got a lot of appeals that he can go through. So they're going to have to deal with him for a while. He might never get executed, depending on how that goes. And the problem is that they there there's two different agencies working together and one agency doesn't prep him because it's not their job to do that. Mm -hmm. And so our guys are distracted getting him into the uniform and everything. And he seems drugged up, but they fail to ask if he is drugged up. So he's playing drugged. And the moment he gets a chance, he attacks them. He wraps it's, his. It's not even the moment he gets a chance because he had. They mentioned he had so well, many chances. Well, but they. I say that that way because he. Paul speculates like when they were in the vehicle, like it, it was too close quarters, and he didn't feel like he had a really good way out. So it's when yeah, they. He get was. He was waiting to maximize the damage the that he of could do. Chaos he I, yeah. I wonder if he thought the cell blocks would be like full and he'd be making a grand entrance to like set a tone with other prisoners and stuff. I I could see that that, too. That was like the, the egomaniacal version that ran through my head of his plan. Guys like that don't even have to have a reason. They just do it to do it. Yeah. He wraps his chains, which in retrospect, the chains on his wrists Mm. too long (laughs) around. Is it Henry? Yeah. Henry's neck and almost kills him. Yeah, he's yep. like sawing it back yeah. and forth. Paul says he's watching this man die in Ugh. front of him. And Percy is just standing there with his baton, the thing he always seems to be desperate to use mm-hmm. on people, frozen in fear. And I think it's Brutal who ends up coming up behind mm. this kid and saving the day. Uh, no, that hasn't happened yet. What? Yeah, the this chapter ends with the standoff still happening. Oops. 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 What if I said about reading ahead, CM? Listeners, ignore me. So we don't know what's going to happen. Boy. So the way this... <laughs> I'm keeping that. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's... Uh, where we end here is that Paul has drawn his gun and heads to the sounds. And when Bill sees him, he wields Dean around in front of his body and uses him as a human shield, which Greg Stilson, take notes. Take, a, take an adult as, as a human shield, not a baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and and oh. that's how we end is him is Paul and Wild Bill staring at each other and Bill basically giving him the look of you have to shoot through him to get to me. Now to wait a couple months for the next <laughs> book to be available in grocery stores. And that is it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. 
Join us next time where we will be reading through part four for Joshua Kahn and Benjamin Graham. I'm CM Alexander reminding you, I want a fried chicken dinner with gravy on the taters. I want a shit in your hat. And I got to have Mae West sit on my face because I'm one horny motherfucker. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to The Green Mile Part 1. We hope you enjoyed it. You can share your thoughts with us on our Facebook or Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public. You can also send us an email at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. And don't forget to connect with us on our Discord for fun discussions, our Patreon for a backlog of a ton of bonus episodes at the $5 and up tier, and our Etsy store for Dairy Public Radio and Stephen King merchandise. Just search Dairy Public Radio on all of those platforms to easily find us. We touched on some serious subject matter this episode. We were very vulnerable with each other and with you. This is a complex issue that lacks a simple solution, and all we ask is that we all show each other some grace. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.